Okay. So welcome everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Ajoy Abuai Japong. I'm the seminar coordinator at CSPS. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to today's seminar. Today we have with us a presentation from Dr. Stephen Afrani, Dr. Murana Mohammed, and Dr. Sylvia Esther Jan. Dr. Afrani is a senior lecturer at the Center for Social Policy Studies, and uh, his research areas are in social protection and development. Dr. Murana Mohammed is the director of programs at the National Commission for Civic Education and has also authored several articles on policy analysis and social protection. Dr. Sylvia Esther-Jan is a senior lecturer at the Department of Sociology and her broad research interests are in the area of reproductive health, uh, mental health, fertility, child marriage, among others. Today, they'll be doing a presentation on COVID-19 shock responsive social protection interventions from a review, narrative review that they have conducted. So this is based on a draft paper that they are going to present also to get your feedback. Um, on that note, I want to welcome you all once again and um, kindly also note that you'll be recording this session for our YouTube channel. Um, so just to let you know, Dr. Frane, Dr. Murana and um, the team, you, are, you have 30 minutes to do your presentation and then we have another 30 minutes of Q&A. Thank you very much. So thank you. Um, thank you, coordinator and everybody. Um, this, is a, this is a short review of how Ghana's response to COVID uh, aligns with the shock responsive social protection as has been the advocacy for uh, all countries. So we have some theoretical um theoretical foundations that is supposed to guide us in the shock responsiveness uh, social protection so i'll leave dr murana mohammed to do the presentation and we'll come in uh doing the q a thank you thank you very much dr japan thank you the uh Dr. Frani for the introductory remarks. Uh, by, yeah. So thank you. And thank you to our participants for joining us. I think the topic for the presentation has been stated already. COVID-19 shock responsive social protection interventions a narrative review of efforts and missed opportunities in Ghana. By way of an outline, this is what we have. Introduction to be followed by the theoretical discussions. We look at Ghana's social protection response, and we then look at how Ghana's social res uh, responses align with the theoretical framework, which is the shock responses social protection. Then we do some conclusions and then make some policy recommendations. As an introduction, we all are aware that COVID-19 pandemic, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic on 11th March, 2020 by the World Health Organization. And across the globe, COVID-19 affected the health, economic, family, educational, and social lives of the people. And in response, countries adopted measures such as partial lockdowns and closures of businesses to keep the spread of the virus. And we all know that all these measures negatively impacted the livelihoods of people. In response, governments of almost all countries, you know, introduced certain social protective measures to alleviate the situation. And on the African continent, as usual, the lockdown severely impacted, you know, low income informal workers. We have to recognize that Africa is one of the continents with very little penetration in terms of uh, social protection. You know, a lot of informal workers are not protected by either existing social assistance or social insurance schemes. And I think COVID-19 period really had highlighted the systematic gaps in terms of uh, social protection systems throughout Africa. 
but you know there are also you know efforts by several countries you know countries such as Cote d'Ivoire Democratic Republic of Congo Gabon Mauritania adopted social solidarity fund and I think Ghana sometimes somehow you know aligns with this the social solidarity fund was like a basket of funding that private sector civil society organization the government pool several funding uh, sources into it in order to assist and make interventions that could alleviate the situation. In other countries, they use instruments such as social assistance, which were existing. In the case of Ghana, existing social assistance could be in the form of LIP. But Ghana is central to our presentation today, so there'll be more details on that. And in terms of the theoretical analysis, the measures that a lot of these countries adopted fall within two forms. We sort of call it the vertical and then horizontal expansion. And in this case, most of these countries either increased the quantum of benefit of existing social protection measures or introduced new beneficiaries on them. Now, focusing on Ghana, we are all familiar with the history as, as far as uh, the measures in Ghana are concerned. But to sort of recap, we all are aware of the introduction of the coronavirus alleviation program. And it is within this context that we did our theoretical uh, analysis. The fact that the government interventions were largely spearheaded by the introduction of the corona, uh, coronavirus alleviation program, which drew funding. And in this context, the aim of our review actually is twofold. One, we discuss garden social protection responses to the COVID-19, which we organize under new and existing measures. Then the second aim is to analyze how Ghana's responses align with the theory, theoretical framework of shock responsive social protection model. Now, our theoretical discussions. There are several theoretical models of social protection, you know, stemming from ILO's protective, preventive, and promotional paradigms, the protective similar to what happened under COVID-19, giving relief, preventive to avert, you know, occurrences of uh, what do you call it, risk and shocks. And promotional measures are also measures that you take to sort of improve upon the livelihoods of people. So things like immunization in school will fall under prom uh, promotional measures. Then also the transformative uh, paradigm introduced by Devrox and Sebastian Wheeler. Uh, our own, uh, what do you call it, one of our experts in social protection in Africa, Adesina introduced the nationalist model, which resonates with Ghana's, for example, current uh, introduction of the free SHS, which is universal. But the focus of today's presentation is on the shock responsive model. And shock responsive social protection really refers to measures that you can, can easily and flexibly respond to emergency situations as we saw during COVID. And the concept became popular in the 2008, 2009. We remember the global financial and food crisis that befell countries in, in the West especially. That brought the notion of bringing social protection models that could help people respond to shock, that could alleviate the, 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 the suffering of those who uh, who suffered the shocks of these events. Then SRSP is really concerned with also the ability of social protection to scale up and down, the support that it gives. And in this context, we are talking about either increasing assistance to existing beneficiaries or temporarily expanding coverage to non-beneficiaries. So this is central to shock responsive social protection. In the process of shock, you should be able to either scale up or scale down. Scaling up meaning increasing the assistance that are given to existing beneficiaries on social protection and 
scaling down, meaning temporarily expanding the coverage to non-beneficiaries. Um, these issues will come into what we call it. We explain this further when we look at Ghana's case in subsequent slides. And in terms of the theoretical discussions, Baca, for example, offered five main options of scaling up under shock responsive social protection. The first is the vertical, second, horizontal. Third, you piggyback. Four, you shadow align. And five, you refocus. Let me take some minutes to expand on these uh, concepts. When shock responsive social protection is expanded vertically, it means that existing beneficiaries who are vulnerable to the shocks will receive an increment in what they receive. If it is social assistance in terms of money, such as in LEAP, you can increase what you call it, the amount of money that they are given. Or we can extend the time period within that uh, facility is being given them. Then horizontal expansion means you draw in new beneficiaries, such like you do sort of uh, under COVID-19, there are specific geographical areas that have been hard hit. They may not be covered by existing social protection measures. You then roll them in, that is expanding horizontally. Then piggybacking. In piggybacking, you use the infrastructure of existing social protection interventions to roll out the shock responsive measures. Invariably, for example, when you take a leap, LEAP has an existing structure. So in terms of shock, and you want to increase the membership of LEAP, you don't do another form of targeting. You piggyback on the targeting mechanisms that LEAP has already, and then you roll out the sort of interventions that you want to roll out. That is piggybacking. Then in under shadow alignment, what really happens is you run a parallel humanitarian uh, what, 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 what do you call it, in humanitarian social protection measures. As we saw under COVID in Ghana, a lot of the interventions, we'll expand on this point later on, but for the purposes of understanding the, uh, the theoretical explications, I want to make this point now. And shadow alignment, the sort of intervention that we had, the assumption that vulnerable people are the recipients of uh, social assistance, Vulnerable people should be the focus of uh, social protection. We saw a sort of a parallel humanitarian assistance going on, which, you know, in theoretical sense, is on the assumption that these people are vulnerable, but which are not being piggybacked as in the form of using the existing structures to do your deployment of interventions. And uh, refocusing. What you do under refocusing in terms of shocks is to reprioritize. For example, due to budget constraint, there are shocks, you sort of uh, pick resources from existing social protection beneficiaries, and then you refocus to areas that have been hard hit by emergency situations. But these are theoretical explanations, but overall, you know, the social, when you talk about shock and the way it happens, our response cannot be pigeonholed to a single framework. So in terms of practice, there is a sort of overlap as to what you do and what works best in terms of uh, shocks, right? Are comprehensive interventions that can draw resources and expertise and implementation strategies from a wide range of stakeholders. And we can testify to that as to uh, what happened during COVID-19 and Ghana's response. The range of stakeholders that are involved, the crowdfunding and so on and so forth. Well, under every social protection measure, one thing that is significant is targeting and shock responsive social protection measures are not excluded. The theoretical underpinnings explain that during shocks, it is better you sort of leverage on existing targeting mechanisms, such as household registers or poverty data or vulnerability data. But as we can see, 
shocks come, some of these uh, shocks and emergencies come unannounced. So targeting can really be difficult at the onset of crisis. In this sense, the proponents of shock responsive suggest that, you know, you do what they call the quick and dirty approach. You pick on what is existing, but we should also note that in picking on existing data and existing, uh, what you call it, uh, household registers, information may be outdated. You are likely to misconstrue poverty as vulnerability. During shocks and during crisis, right, it could affect, as we saw under COVID, the initial places that we identify people who have been affected by COVID are Kaswa, which is, you know, partly urban. But in terms of our poverty analysis, we link uh, social protection to, uh, or, or our social assistance to largely uh, uh, remote portions or deprived communities. But under COVID, we observe that the vulnerability becomes urban, where in terms of uh, the rural urban divide and poverty analysis, right, will be comparatively better off than rural areas. So if you use existing data and existing registers, the, the likelihood is that you are likely to mis misconstrue uh, poverty for vulnerability. Now let's look at Ghana's responses. And the response to shock by Ghana resulting from COVID-19 had been mixed. You know, the focus was how do we salvage the economy while you also provide remedial interventions to support households and different categories of vulnerable people. And in that context, the government really announced the release of $200 million to households and businesses to address the disruptions and on their social and economic lives. In this paper, we focus on government measures because really there were several actors and there were several interventions that you know, a single paper can hardly capture what all these interventions are, how the, all these interventions have been implemented. But in terms of our analysis, we saw that Ghana adopted two tracks. There were emphasis on existing measures such as, such as the leap, you know, provision of uh, consumers below lifeline, uh, below the lifeline in terms of consumption of electricity. During COVID, a lot of them were zero rated. And then there was also an absorption of 50% of light bills for people who were consuming above the uh, lifeline. There was also the planting for food and jobs, and then also the school feeding. Then in the educational sector, we have the online radio TV lessons for school. These were existing measures that were that continued during COVID. Then there were new measures brought in temporarily to you know, sort of uh, uh, back up the existing measures. And under this, we can speak of the provision of food for 400,000 individuals and homes, the absorption of water bills for all Ghanaians for a certain period of time, and the soft loan schemes that were given to small and medium scale enterprises, and also insurance package for frontline health workers. This, uh, I'll skip this because it seemed to be uh, just the list of governments, how government captured its intervention. Now, we look at how Ghana's, how these interventions, both the existing and then the new interventions Ghana adopted, how do they align to shock responsive social inter intervention theoretical framework? In our analysis, we applied the five typology, right, that were propounded by BASA for scaling up interventions in terms of shock. I earlier on explained the vertical you know, expansion, which in, increases the amount of support that people who are already on existing social protection receive. So in terms of Ghana's uh, uh, interventions, the, the zero rate of life from consumers of electricity, right, were charged nothing, which means in terms of the benefits that they receive, the benefit has increased. Then we talk about our school feeding program. School feeding usually was taking place in school, cooked meals, but during COVID, the, so there was sort of a, 
uh, uh, expansion vertically because under COVID, the school kids were given raw food that covered not only them, but some members of the household that they lived. And in terms of the online radio and TV, we, the previous intervention of government was largely on uh, TV broadcasts on GTV. But during COVID, the benefit was also expanded. There were online production of lessons, which some of them were uploaded and circulated on WhatsApp. It was also expanded on radio. And also, you know, uh, the TV lessons were also expanded. I, you know, I can't speak of it for sure, but the lessons that were existing, as, uh, as far as I can remember, were targeting only uh, JHS and then senior high schools. But during COVID, I think the TV, uh, 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 the TV lessons expanded to basic schools. Now let's see what interventions align with horizontal. And by horizontal expansion, we are talking about bringing in new beneficiaries on social protection, on existing social protection. Now we remember that at a point in time, the electricity and water subsidies were expanded to everyone. And that is people who were not enjoying any sub, uh, subsidies for electricity and then water, now enjoy electricity and uh, water, for instance, free of charge. Also, as an afterthought, as a matter of fact, the leap leverage on the Ghana household register, you know, and expanded it to, to the extremely poor in the five northern regions and also to which it comes. What I mean by this is that uh, in the height of COVID, I think there was what to update or to uh, sort of continue the household register that was started some years back. And the target was for the, uh, in the five uh, regions of the North. And those who were found to be, uh, what do you call it, uh, extremely poor were down, put on leap, right? And then also there is the extension of the leap to which it comes. Regrettably, since after COVID, you know, those new beneficiaries have been taken out of the leap relief. Also, planting for food and job also enrolled new farmers during COVID, which means it expanded horizontally. Now, if you take piggybacking, the we explain piggybacking as a sort of strategy where you implement shock responsive measures using the structures of existing social inter uh, interventions. So under COVID, the government social interventions sort of piggyback, just like I explained earlier, the household register and LEAP, right, were brought in, honestly, as an afterthought. So the household register and the, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, the LEAP data was used and the interventions, the new relief support given to beneficiaries were ruled on these uh, existing structures. And as a matter of fact, when we talk about shadow alignment, that is where Ghana's soft loans, you know, they were shadow aligned in the sense that uh, they were ruled out with the assumption that, oh, this is what social protection does. It gives relief to poor people, to vulnerable people, but it was not uh, put directly under the institutions and structures that give this relief. It was not put under the, the LEAP, uh, what do you call it, for example. It was not put under the Department for Community Development. It ran parallel to existing uh, social protection measures. So as the soft loans to SMEs. But regrettably, there was no any intervention, oh, sorry, not regrettably, but as a matter of fact, there was no any intervention that was refocused because of COVID. Now, in terms of our analysis, we sort of look at Ghana's uh, provision of some of these interventions as nearing a sort of re uh, universal relief packages. For example, the absorption of water bills and light bills, you know, became universal. And in discussions on social protection, these are, 
you know, much desirable ways of doling out uh, or implementing social protective measures. In countries that have advanced in their social protection interventions, most of the interventions are normally universal. The advantage of universal provision of social protection into, uh, 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 packages is that it diffuses middle-class resentment that, uh, that comes honestly with selective entitlement. Invariably, the taxes of uh, middle class are used to give relief to sort of uh, people who we say are deprived, are, uh, uh, are extremely poor. But, and that creates sort of resentment. Um, not the cause of uh, poverty in the country. Why should my tax be used to take care of uh, a poor person? But when social protection measures become universal, there are two advantages. This resentment from middle class goes away and also it also get voice. So the approach of universal uh, provisioning is commendable, but it has not been sustained. So these are all issues of just theoretical uh, uh, explanations. Another diversion, dimension of uh, shock responsive social protection that we can say was brought to bear was the diversity of service providers. We saw under COVID, government, religious organizations, civil society, you know, there was sort of crowdfunding. Even political parties were involved. They drew resources. The crowdfunding, which goes hand in hand with the sort of solidarity funding that some countries systematically mobilized. And also in Ghana, the, uh, the Ghana, the, the private sector, the private sector angle of the uh, COVID-19 relief also sort of did sort of this uh, crowdfunding. It goes hand in hand with the theoretical postulations of shock responses, social protection in the fact that shocks come unannounced, crises come unannounced, and you need like each and everyone on board to be able to deal with it, you know, in a uh, very comprehensive manner. Now our conclusions. The responses from Ghana have been mixed. And we say that except for the expansion of existing interventions, such as the LEAP, the school feeding, and then the planning for food and job and utility rebates, the new measures were largely para humanitarian systems, which goes hand in hand with uh, uh, the dimension of so uh, shock responsive social protection we call the shadow alignment. And in fact, the shadow alignment exposes the weakness in social protection generally and the weakness of Ghana's intervention in sort of uh, during the COVID crisis. Now we look at the weaknesses and then the missed opportunities in terms of social protection generally, and specifically during the COVID. The theories of shock responsive social protection postulate that the initial thing you do during crisis is to leverage on existing data. Unfortunately, the leap and the Ghana Household Register came in terms of the deployment of a relief, sorry, as a sort of an afterthought. Just um, A lot had gone, has taken place already. And some things had gone wrong already before we remember that there was sleep, there was the Ghana Household Register, we need to then go and uh, expand registration in the five northern regions before we can give relief to them. One thing that comparatively other countries such, like, such as uh, South Africa have that we don't have is our Social Protection Act. South Africa has its acts that draws funding from government. So there is already existing funding. But Ghana is yet to pass the social protection bill. And when passed, it might contain provisions for dedicated funding and clear cut support structure for social protection. And once you have that, at least crisis could be unpredictable, but you will know that they will come. So even though you could be taken by events, you could be taken by surprise, but at least there may be some minimal uh, uh, preparation. But there has not been any dedicated funding for uh, social protection generally, apart from the here and there. So when we are able to get our social protection act, we can, you know, domestically 
you know, seed funding for it. And in terms of crisis, we can easily fall on it. And also the failure to initially use existing structures. Things were done so haphazardly. Everybody thought that they could go into communities and give relief. Existing institutions that are the Department of Community Development and CSOs, which you could have channeled uh, relief items to, were at the onset left out. And the relief went and they were actually haphazardly distributed. And as a result, distribution of relief items compromised safety measures. They said that the COVID spread in crowded places, but we are all seeing the pictures in terms of uh, how people were getting crowded to take to get relief items. The compromise safety measures and also compromise the intention behind the distribution of relief measures because the relief were to be given to vulnerable people, a lot of them aged, a lot of them people with disability. But when vehicles moved into communities and started doing distribution, it was able-bodied men and women who were able to access such relief items. And invariably that really aggravated the targeting errors. You know, there are, we, the theoretical discussions about targeting errors are well known, the uh, exclusion and then inclusion errors. And in the process, because of the way things were done in an uncoordinated manner, the interventions, some of them were susceptible to corruption. And you know, that is a matter for another discussion. I think there are other studies that have looked at corruption within the deployment of interventions under COVID and so on and so forth. Now our recommendation, we therefore recommend that the Minister of Gender, Children and Social Protection should speed up the creation of a common targeting platform for social protection. Invariably, the Ghana Household Register has started. There is the need for us to complete it and use it for identification of vulnerable people so that we don't expect any future shocks to they happen. When it happens, at least we have something to use as a first step in terms of targeting. Also, the need for us to pass the social protection bill becomes very important. Also, the lessons that we have learned shows that in terms of deployment of relief during pandemic or during any shock, there is the need for us to combine education and enforcement. At the initial stages, people even were not aware of the risk in getting crowded. So we should have used education complementarily with the enforcement. Police and relief uh, workers should have gone into communities together. Whilst distribution are taking place, the police and other security agencies will be enforcing social distancing and will be ensuring that people who really need the relief are those who get. On this note, I bring the presentation to an end and uh, these are some of the references that we used in our paper. Thank you very much, Dr. Japon. Thank you, our participants. Thank you very much, Dr. Imrana Mohammed, for this excellent presentation and a good stock taking of what happened you know, during COVID. And I think that most of us have also really understood some of these theoretical grounding you know, and how we're, we're gonna lie in terms of the measures that we took. So now we are going to um, ask participants to either raise their hands or pose their questions in the chat for um, a discussion on the presentation. The floor is open. Anyone with any questions, suggestions, comments can please raise their hands or post their comments in the chat and I can also read them out. So let me see if there's anyone's hands up. Okay. Um, Lanekia, Prof, please come in. Yes. Thank you so much. This was a very interesting presentation. I am interested in the idea of shadow alignment. And beyond COVID-19, we've had other instances, other shocks or disasters. For instance, the June 3rd flooding, um, the Apiazzi explosion. Yeah, where yeah. the government seems to have created parallel structures. So they might set up a committee yeah. or a different sort of funding mechanism for it. 
And I wonder what you think might account for this tendency to create parallel stru structures. Uh, for instance, do you think it might be that the existing structures don't work as well? There may be a political reason. What, do you have thoughts on this? Thank you. Um, you can answer this question and then let's see if others have other questions later. Oh, okay. More questions. All right. I think my, my thoughts, very insightful <laughs> observation because it continues. There are existing structures that could be leveraged on, right? I, my, you know, personal thoughts are that most of these interventions are, uh, uh, emanate from, what do you call it? A lot of a uh, political class who will invariably, we know the nature of uh, politics in our country, who will invariably would like to take, you know, political advantage in dishing out or giving out relief. If it goes into the name of our uh, institution, a particular political party is out, but the, the intervention is coming from government. Government is made up of politicians. So except when we really pass the social protection bill and there we can look at how we enforce, you know, adherence to structures for social protection interventions. I think if in the absence of that, we are likely to see uh, the, 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 this sort of, uh, 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 parallel addition out of humanitarian services. In, in, in fact, uh, uh, there is the need for us to sort of reinforce relationship between institutions too. NADMO, for example. Is it? Brother. Yes. Uh, you went off for some time. Oh, okay. Actually, we could hear him. Yeah. Oh, you could yeah. hear him. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, maybe so. In addition, I think uh, what the global uh, agenda is for countries to have shock responsive social protection in a way that is so comprehensive that it is able to respond to any shock that comes. Um, that is what we don't. I think we've lost Dr. Frani. Dr. Ive. To anything so that it doesn't become us and when it comes, we have to develop a new, uh, a new, a new intervention. That is the global agenda now that we need to have a very comprehensive, flexible social protection framework to be responding to the shocks as and when they come. And what we have in Ghana does not seem to be comprehensive enough to be dealing with that. And again, as he said about not even having the legal uh, act, the act to support us to generate funds available and all those things. So that's where we have to go. Uh, if, until we get there, we'll always be doing the firefighting. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Fani. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. So, um... There's another question in the chat from Eunice, who is asking if from your study you found any um, evidence from other countries who have a um, social protection fund for emergency response. And um, she's asking this also because if um, the law is not accompanied by a fund, then it might render it ineffective. So that is the question from Eunice. Um, let me ask Amos to also come in and then you can answer both questions. Amos question. Thank you. Um, my question is um, with respect to um, one of the interventions under vertical um, dimension, uh, that's the online radio and TV lessons. Um, the first question uh, would be, given that the, uh, the reach 
of um, uh, our internet connectivity, um, access to televisions and radios. Um, it is still not encouraging us across the country. Would you say that this serves its purpose as, as uh, efficient uh, social protection intervention within um, the framework as you have just discussed. And then the second one is just a concern. Uh, I have a difficulty placing this intervention uh, under uh, your vertical level as you have um, um, uh, explained to us earlier. Uh, given that, I think, um, though we can all go back and, and then uh, discuss, uh, I think the online radio television program or intervention uh, was a kind of um, novel or um, uh, a, uh, a response or approach that was uh, rolled out, um, which was non-existent within or at the time. That's why I'm saying we can still go back and have this discussion because it is an online uh, basic or online or digital intervention that was geared or targeted at um, uh, basic schools across the country, which was not in existence at, at the time. So that's my difficulty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amos. Um, yes, please, no. you can come in. Look, no. yeah. Dr. Efrani. Yes. I know you'd like to come in. Okay. I, I, I don't know what that example you, you are taking or, or can come in. You can come in now, then we'll take the next set after this one. Okay. So um, let me take the first one of the countries that uh, have uh, existing funds. If you look at South Africa and others, there are some countries that are having the, um, the act supporting social protection. And there are clearly defined uh, vulnerable groups. And then uh, it is made clear that the government will um, so sponsor social protection from the taxes. So the money is there. And people can register as and when they, they think that they are vulnerable. Assessment will be done and you are enrolled onto, onto that. So there are examples of countries that have uh, laws supporting some dedicated fund. And in the, the Ghana bill, um, there have been suggestions regarding how do we have dedicated fund for social protection. So in the bill that has been submitted and is waiting for long, there's some kind of uh, dedication as suggestions, how to raise fund purposely for social protection. I mean, so that, that is there. Um, for the online, the challenges, the point where argument you are making is that there was some existing um, television program before COVID, program that was um, more or less teaching some courses targeting the vulnerable and the deprived societies in anticipation that after their classes or whatever, they can still be listening to radio. So our assessment is not the effectiveness. Our assessment is the fact that there was some existing intervention. It has been scaled up and some have been added on. So that is where we are looking at a vertical expansion from. I don't know whether it was I'm making, I'm making sense of that. There was some existing television program yeah. I mean, that was targeting at vulnerable uh, people who could not have the quality teachers that others were having. So that was there before COVID. And so when COVID came, more or less, that was expanded to cover, I mean, larger population and also more of the online programs were added on. So it is in that line that we are talking about the vertical expansion of the program. Maybe yeah, and also I think Dr. Freni has answered the I think the first part. He also talked about accessibility, you know, and I think uh, is a very good observation because you've introduced content, but it's accessibility. He talks about the 
internet penetration, people live in areas where internet access is difficult. And I think in uh, our uh, conversation on these people, these are the issues that come up, which could also be uh, a, a sort of another presentation of people, inclusion and exclusion in terms of how uh, COVID relief were, you know, were, 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 were implemented. Because there are the physically, I don't know, people who could not see, could not use the TV content, people who have a hearing impairment could not access the radio content that were given. So these are also dimension. I think uh, Amos is right spot on on raising the issue about inclusion. Thank you very much, both of you. I, yes, Amos, are you, are you satisfied? Are you convinced that it should be? <laughs> yes. Um, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced to a very large extent. Um, okay. uh, Dr. Frani, my only challenge was um, um, you are certain that um, there is a kind of existing structure with regards to online or TV lessons before this particular one was rolled out. Uh, that's why I say we can still go back and have that conversation. I think this is um, a, a completely new intervention that um, was rolled out without um, uh, leveraging on any existing structure. Uh, but it's a conversation that we can still go and then look at. Okay. Yeah, yeah we, we, can, we, can, we can look at it. We can look at it. All right. Thank you very much, Amos. Um, we have Matt Sonson. Also, if you want to show your video whilst asking your question, you are, you are please free to do so. Matt Sonson. Yes, please. Thank you very much, Doc. And thank you very much, um, Doc, for your presentation also. And please, um, in your conclusion, you mentioned that um, the, response, the social protection responses, some of the responses the government raised and during the COVID-19 time were more like an afterthought. For instance, the distribution of food and even giving loans to the SME, uh, SMEs, and wow. even those existing social protection programs were not properly utilized. And so the conclusion you came to was that uh, it was an afterthought. Um, and then in the recommendations also, you mentioned that there's a need for the social protection bill to be uh, yeah. worked on. Also, uh, harmonizing all the social protection um, programs that we have in the country to be one that you are recommending. Yeah. Which of the two um, positions do you consider a priority in terms of strengthening the various social protection programs or harmonizing? them in the form of a legislation or a program of government do you consider um, a better option? Thank you. Thank you very much, Martinson. Um, Dr. Fani and Dr. Mohammed, you can come in. Okay, so let me come for the, for the first question of um, the afterthought. I think he made reference to the afterthought with regards to the existing. If you look at LEAP, it was later on that they had to, I mean, use the, uh, the existing data they have collected for the household registry to do this targeting them. I mean, Celeste and people to do that. In addition to that, they had to do some survey uh, in some uh, hotspot areas for those, the homeless and all that also to give them what they call the emergency leave. So this was not something that, that came up. What came up earlier on was doing more of the new interventions, but using the existing one was more of, of the afterthought. Before going to the alleged watches camp, it was not something they had thought of using leave. It was not even part of the things they were thinking. But later on, they realized the way to I uh, mean, target the those at the witches camp and give them also put them on the leap. So that is what we re refer to as the afterthought, but not all the measures that we are saying the, the afterthought. So that, that that is my response to the first part of this. Maybe a brother can take the second part. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I think the second part talks about era strengthening existing social protection intervention and then also uh, harmonizing them and uh, structures, which I think the two points are valid because in as much as the existing ones are running, we can't say they are running perfectly. There is the need for us to stand in, strengthen the existing structures, probably you know, improve upon targeting. There is also the need for harmony when you are bringing new interventions. I think you first of all deploy such interventions looking at existing structures first, right? There should be a very compelling reason why you would like new social protection measures should run parallel to existing ones. So Madison, these are the few points I would like to make on your comments. So, so in addition to that, I think Madison, one, one challenge with the social protection in Ghana is lack of the lack of coordination. We have a LIPW. So that one is, I mean, located at the liver. You have some located in agri, some at the local government. So there are, we have problem with coordination of our social protection. Some of the things, some of the intervention could be complemented. So we have complementary. Just as you have lead, when you are a lead beneficiary, they try to link you to NHIS, school feeding and all that. But we have most of these programs that are more or less in their own PG holes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Fane. Are there any more questions? Doing complementary services and all that. So that is where we want we want to go. Otherwise, we are wasting resources, duplicating interventions and all that. Thank you. Thank you, ma. ma. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, are there any questions? There's a there's a mess um, a text from. Mildred de Desica, who is saying that there seemed to be a huge similarity between adaptive social protection and shock responsive social protection. What is a clear cut distinction between these two? Between adapt adaptive social protection and so shock responsive social protection. So what we refer, what we are looking at, shock responsive social protection is a social protection that is flexible and comprehensive enough to be able to respond to shocks, weather, fire, COVID, um, flood, drought. So they are able to respond to them without necessarily creating additional structures. We have a framework that is accommodative enough to respond to the shocks as they come. So that is what we, we are referring to as a responsive social protection. Um, Mildred. Okay, um, Mildred, do you, want, do you want to follow up on that or that's fine? Okay, so Eunice, Eunice's hand is up. Eunice, please ask your question. Yes, um, uh, thank you very much. Um, I just want to add a bit to uh, the point that Dr. Fanny raised about the challenge with uh, uh, coordination. And uh, I come from the uh, field of uh, practice um, to you know, flag that, I mean, the, the, the challenge of coordination it's not, you know, only about uh, social protection. And one of the things um, we, I, I know happens to deal with the uh, coordination is moving beyond seeing one ministry as the uh, facilitator of, 
or yeah, as, as a facilitator of the implementation of programs to complementing that with, you know, uh, an interministerial or inter uh, agency uh, a working group to 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 deal with the uh, challenge of uh, coordination. And so, my uh, suggestion, because I think this is very uh, important to inform a uh, practice, is to reflect also some uh, 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 practical ways of uh, dealing with the uh, kind of chaos we saw. Uh, around the take up of uh, strategies around uh, uh, social protection in uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Yune. Thank you. So, um, Yune, I don't know. So, were you expect? Are you expecting to get some feedback on some of the practical ways in which we can ensure such coordination, or it was a mainly uh, a comment and add on to their presentation. Well, maybe um, maybe both presenters can 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 reflect on the okay. uh, possibility of uh, introducing some of the uh, radical things because mm -hmm. I think one of the things um, uh, we struggle with is you know uh, how to begin acting on recommendations you know, uh, and we can really uh, bridge that gap between just getting recommendations to really suggesting some practical ways. So uh, I'll be glad to, I mean, hear from Dr. Fani and uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed on what they think is possible with this study. Thank you. Okay, so Dr. Fani and Dr. Mohammed, this is to you. Okay, so I think the, the interministerial um, coordination is good, but it is too abstract, too remote from, from practice, what is on the ground. And at times, we, we say interministerial, but people who even attend the meetings do not have the capacity to make any um, substantive um, decisions on that. So apart from the interministerial level, if we have them running through to the regional and districts and they're making sure that these are not just interministerial, but there are also coordination of the, the various programs, uh, social protection programs, as they are scattered in the various ministries. And that, that coordination and supervision, I mean, hierarchy is there from the national to regional and district. I think that is what uh, I believe can work. Otherwise, decisions are made in Accra and not, no action is taken. So for now, that will be my, my response to that, but will also reflect the more practical uh, recommendation. Thank you. Um, let me give the last slot to Juliet Masamaka for a question or input. Juliet, please unmute yourself and then. Hello, Juliet, are you there? If you are speaking, we can't hear you. She's muted. She's muted, yeah. Okay, so maybe let me just use the opportunity to maybe just also ask my my own question around, you know, you talked about the universal, yes, as a moderator, let me just enjoy my privilege <laughs> of um, the universal access you know, the, the universal framework. And I'm wondering to what extent do you think this really um, is resource, you know, if, uh, ensures efficiencies of resource, especially in developing country context. So if Europe and the Americas are doing universal interventions during COVID, do you think this is how it should also be done and, and why? Apart from the fact that of course, it's, you, you gave reasons why 
it is a good approach. I'm just asking if you could reflect more on on how um this kind of takes shape in in our in our context, you know, of informality, our context of extreme poverty and you know extreme rich people and wealthy people, that kind of inequality that exists. Maybe just in one minute. Okay, so for universal is used in basically two ways. Universal in terms of life course. Um, to say that each stage of one's life, there is bound to be vulnerability from childhood to the age. Of. So we need to have a kind of social protection scheme that responds to vulnerability at various stages in one's life. So that is one way we, we talk about uh, universality. But universality in terms of specific intervention, uh, like LIP, um, in our, in our case, it's difficult, but the reason why at times we do universal in Ghana and other places, lack of data for targeting. So you don't have data. So for instance, with the free SHS, we don't have data to even do targeting. Assuming we wanted to support only the, but the most vulnerable and maybe do some kind of a rebate for those who can pay. Data is not there for us to do the targeting to be able to uh, make good use of our resources. But we can do the universal targeting in terms of the leap, for instance. We did some like the electricity. Um, and if you look at electricity, the, the non poor benefited more than the poor. Because those on the lifeline, how, how much were they using? And you have people who were paying 1,000 and 2,000, and the government is paying 50% for them against the one who was paying uh, 40 cities and governments say don't pay. So if you look at their contest, we, if you don't have data to target and use resources prudently, the universal um, protection is very difficult in our context. But that, that also does not mean that in terms of the life course, the agent, the um, uh, women who are the pregnant women, children, we must have social protection that covers those who are vulnerable along the life course. But, but not to say the kind of the school feeding or the, the free education that we are having that we don't have the money, but everybody is uh, being paid for. Everybody's child is being paid for. That is very expensive for us as a country, developing country. Okay, so thanks, thanks for the clarification and the, the explanation as well. Um, I think that we have already, I don't know, Juliet, are you there? Otherwise we can, yes, we can just end. So thanks so much um, for, for this presentation, Dr. Fane and Dr. Mirana Mohammed. Um, it was very insightful. Yes, yeah, for me, I, I think- I missed a point. Yes, I think we, we, I, we lost you. We lost you for, yes. for a while. But yes, we'll, share the, yes. we'll share the recordings, so I'm sure you can have access to, to the discussion. But we were talking about some, no, of the practical, okay. some of the practical ways in which we can um, deal with um, <clears throat> the issues yeah. around so ESDs. If, yeah, if you could allow me, just uh, I think there was a point about coordination. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are best practices. Mm -hmm. The Bosta Familia of Brazil, which is started as one of the success story in terms of... Uh, social assistant was actually part of the success is the sort of preeminence and the power that was given to the minister in charge of social protection in Brazil. Anything that you do, trade, agriculture has bearing on vulnerability and other things. So I think the story of Brazil is that this minister is in the meeting of every ministry and at in cabinet, the, the, the Minister for Social Protection in Brazil was a sort of a, sort of a senior voice in terms of the impact of other economic, you know, uh, other policies on social policy. And also I had a conversation about universality. And I think there is also, uh, what do you call it, very important social protection. The successes, if you look at the Scandinavian countries, the sort of universal provision accounts for 
their successes in, in terms of several social development indicators. But just like Dr. Afrani said, you have issues about funding and also you have issues about targeting. But that doesn't take the conversation because there is also the literature about how you implement universal schemes. Does universal universality, does it mean everybody? Does it mean if you are targeting the aged? Okay, we have all the aged in the basket. In that case, you have universal in that context. And also universality in terms of the funding. Who funds it? Do you have universal funding? Or is it only government that is going to fund? So I think those conversations are, all, are also there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for the submission. So um, I guess on that note, we would like to say thank you to all of you who came. And this is a very good way to, to sum it up. Um, we've learned a lot around you know, the framework for social protection, especially in, in emergency situations. And, I think that in the in the context of Ghana, we've we've indicated the need to strengthen existing structures and also how to enhance the kind of coordination that is really there. And I I I would say that in our context, one of the our main challenges remain how to target and the, the issue of informality, and we don't have access to data, we don't have address systems, we don't even have any proper way of checking, you know, people's finances to know who even needs what. So there, there's, there's still a lot to, to do and there's still a lot to study. And we thank Dr. Frane and Dr. Mohammed for this excellent presentation. We hope to continue the discussion and then when your paper is out, you can also share with us and then we can um, read. Thank you very thank much, you. all of you, and then have a good afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Japan. And thank you.